Hi everybody, this is Chris West from House Calls Vermont, and we're here with another interview. Today, we have the good fortune of having um, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, John Rockwell from uh, Zender America. John, welcome to uh, uh, House Calls Vermont. Thanks for taking time out to meet with us. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Great. So, um, we do a series of interviews. We interview pe people from all different parts of the industry. And of course, Zender is uh, a company that makes uh, ventilation systems, heat recovery ventilation systems, uh, and also uh, enthalpy or energy recovery systems. Everything from the box that does all the work to the tubes and plenums and, um, and uh, everything from uh, large systems, and I think Zender, Zender is, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much specifically just residential. You guys top out at the, like the CA 500 or the 550, right? So Zender America does top out at a unit that does a maximum of about 325 CFM in a, in a boost mode. Um, internationally, the Zender group offers rooftop units that you see on large commercial buildings up to 8,000 CFM, something like that. So um, that's not the model we're pursuing here. It's mostly residential, small commercial. Um, we're finding that optimizing ventilation in multifamily, it's a philosophical choice between, or a pragmatic choice and philosophical choice between rooftop units that serve the entire building and have to overcome stack effect or individual units where mm, individual maintenance is a little more uh, um, involved. Right. So just, just I think what I, what you mean there is if we're designing a, a building and the building has multiple units, there are mm -hmm. different options for how we get ventilation air to them. And one of them is one large unit on the roof or a series of large units, depending on how big they are, all that serve the entire building uh, or having individual units in each each apartment, say. Um, and that's another option. And if you're going to have 35 apartments and each one has an individual Zender unit, that's going to increase maintenance because then you have 50 filters that need to be changed out, et cetera. That's right. That's exactly right, uh, which might cause somebody to say, well, why would I bother doing that? But it turns out that stack effect can really wreak havoc on a rooftop centralized building, a uh, centralized ventilation system in a tall building in a cold climate. Um, so individual units are the optimal way to do that but other forces are at play that developers need to take into account. So um, property management is one of them, um, but generally the performance is spectacular of individual units that serve one or a few apartments. So. Yeah, and, and we've seen companies uh, also coming up with, with uh, in order to deal with that same stack effect in large buildings, we've seen mm -hmm. companies come up with units that just do one floor, uh, yep. like the Ventis Ventacity and others. Um, right. But in general, and, and uh, the, the experience that I have with Zender overall is with the individual one unit um, pieces. And uh, so the, uh, my experience started about 11 years ago mm -hmm. uh, when I did a deep energy retrofit, learned about Pacifel Standard, became a Pacifel consultant and had a CA350 installed in my, in my house. So mm -hmm. one of the things I would just want to mention to our viewers is it, Zender is a, uh, a company, a European company, um, that uh, got most of its uh, uh, HRV technology by buying a company called Stork Air, right, which is a Dutch company, which is another tie-in that I have. I happen to remember Stork Air, and I had a friend who worked there when he found out that that I was doing Zender. He was like, hey, I, I used to work uh, for Stork Air. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so the reason I bring that up is because the CA350, that doesn't mean much to an American, but if you talk to a European designer, that's how many uh, cubic meters per hour these units handle, right? Isn't that's the metric? That's right. It's, it's the metric uh, way of describing airflow. And so like many companies, even here in North America, the model number often relates to the maximum capacity. Um, I will say that some people presume that that is the ventilation rate that should be used in a house and make the selection incorrectly by, based on that number. You really don't want to run an ERV continuously or HRV continuously at that maximum speed because you're not going to get the maximum thermal recovery efficiency. You're not going to get the 
optimal moisture recovery efficiency. The electric consumption per CFM or per cubic meter per hour is not optimized. And wear and tear and noise become issues. Right. So just like a car, you don't get very good fuel economy in city driving you think you might get few, good fuel economy at very high speeds because highway mileage seems to be higher than city driving, but the effect of friction on the movement through air or moving air through pipes uh, is not proportional to fan speed. So if you double fan speed, you much more than double friction. So as a result, the sweet spot for ventilation systems is somewhere around 60% maybe 65% if you're running it continuously. Of course, there are some people who put it on a timer relay and run it maximum, maximum capacity for small amounts of time to create an overall ventilation effect. But that doesn't necessarily respond to when there's a, a high pollution event, for lack of a better term. Uh, so continuous is sort of our, our MO. Right. And, and in general, when I'm designing passive houses or, or houses that require mechanical ventilation for hy hygienic air, I always, um, you always oversize the unit based on the fact that you want it to be running somewhere around 70%, right? 65 to 75%. So that's right, but I wouldn't use the word oversize because some people who equate ventilation systems with heating systems know that oversizing is a no-no because of short cycling in heating systems. If right. those run on and off too quickly, you're never getting steady state efficiency. There is no problem with oversizing an ERV, even if somebody gave you a, a 500 CFM unit and you only need 100 CFM, right. because there's you're no just using less fan energy. For it. Yeah. That's right, that's yeah. exactly right. And the efficiencies, we've spoken about this on our show before with our, with our viewers, um, the heat exchangers do better the longer the fluid is in contact with both sides of the heat exchanger, right? You have a membrane of some kind, and there's either, it's either letting heat through or heat and moisture. And the longer those two streams are in contact, the better the efficiencies are. So the, the faster we're sending air through this thing, the lower the efficiencies are going to be. That's right, Chris. And the analogy I use... Um, and I appreciate you using the word fluid, although I rarely use that with uh, <laughs> with customers. But you're exactly right, because air is a fluid. But um, I, the analogy I use is shaking somebody's hand who comes in from the cold. The, the longer you hold that person's hand and shake their hand, the more thermal energy gets transferred from the warmer body to the cooler body. Oh, I like that. So, I'll, I'll keep that in mind next time I'm, yeah, I'm yep. explaining it. Yep. Yep. So, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of Zender. I, I personally, uh, when I redid my house, one of the things that was a huge attraction to me was not just the high efficiency on the core because the sensible recovery efficiency of the HRV and the ERVs are quite high, um, but also the ease of installation. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. plug and play using the the, uh, the Comfo tubes and, and the other, the plenums and the plug-in and uh, I mean, and mine was a retrofit, so I, I had a tuck under garage that, that was completely unframed and had no drywall, allowing me a lot of opportunity to make chases that I could send stuff and then up through closet walls and things. And the Zender system was just perfect. And it, it's really kind of a plug and play. You, you have, you know, 12 to 15 CFM per tube. You need 36 CFM, you do three tubes. You put a diffuser that accepts the three tubes. Uh, and you're done. Uh, they're all home runs back to a central plenum, um, so there's no duct sizing, which is one of the things I really like about the system as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is important to note, I, I agree, uh, retrofits, no matter whether you're doing a traditional trunk and branch system or the home run system that we use, there's going to be some disruption in a, in a retrofit where it's already finished and you've got drywall on studs and ceilings. The fact that it's three-inch tubing and can snake through a stud wall, provided you don't have wiring going across that stud. Or back plastering there's, or some other. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yep. So there's a big advantage to that. I do want to try to eliminate the mistaken, um, what's the word, for the cliche that, well, you, you have to have a passive house to warrant mechanical ventilation. I don't really think that's true. It may not be the right move to only get mechanical ventilation with heat recovery when you have an inefficient house. You probably should do some air sealing to save some energy and improve on comfort before that. But bath fans, while a much cheaper option, waste energy because there's no heat recovery and they have no impact on the indoor air quality of 
most distant or any sleeping area nearby because you're not delivering fresh filtered air there. I would even, so, I would even counter and say um, because it, the the source of that air is uncontrolled, mm. we're often, Jim and I often talk about pulling air through a cavity uh, filled with fiberglass that mice are living in. So the yeah. entire quality, yeah. there's no question that having a bath fan on is not going to increase the uh, air qu indoor air quality of your bedrooms with the door closed or anything like that. Yep, that's but, right. But uh, just to throw that out there, we, we, we don't like sucking through the muck, as, they, as uh, Joe Kubrick <laughs> yeah. once, yeah, once yeah. said. <laughs> exactly. And I would point your Vermont, Vermont listeners or any listeners really in the internet age to some studies that have been done by Brian Just from Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Uh, he did a study of 22 Vermont homes, some of which had no ventilation, some of which relied on windows for ventilation, some of which relied, relied on bathroom fans for ventilation, and some that had whole house ventilation with heat recovery to see what happened when doors were shut in sleeping rooms to carbon dioxide levels. And in some cases, I believe the numbers were way over 3,000, maybe even 4,000 parts yeah. per million, yeah. which is a problem. So you look up Brian Just, VEIC, CO2 study, you'll find that information available. And it's a, it's a really concise report and uh very well done so it's a yeah big, well uh, fortunately uh not surprisingly my house was one of the houses that was a part of the ah. study and my house had the best indoor air quality of all the, ah. the houses um and we cite that study uh on the show all the time yeah. um, okay. and and i'm a big fan of of doing that kind of work right yep. uh actually finding out what's happening in someone's house as a matter of fact uh both Jim and I are big fans of the Air Visual Pro. This is a small unit that you can put in your house and move around. Uh, mm. And we've been doing um, independent indoor air quality studies with that. Um, and so uh, what we've been able to show uh, just with the five or six houses that we've done this on is that some of these bedrooms, when you close the door at night, uh, are up in the 4,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide, yeah. which in the end is not dangerous because, you know, you open the door, you bring the fresh air, but it can reduce comfort. It can cause drowsiness. It can cause all kinds of very uh, limited and recuperable, mm -hmm. but definitely cognitive issues. So yeah. um, we want our indoor air quality to be, be good. I was looking uh, a while back at the, um, the basis for the assumption that any house that's tighter than two air changes per hour at 50 pascals should have mechanical ventilation and should, in my opinion, have a balanced mechanical ventilation system. And what I found was that the, uh, the standard that was used to, to come up with that has a lot of very loose numbers. You know, there's like mm -hmm. these bands across the country of these these factors that you're supposed to put in, and and all of Vermont is what is one you know, one factor that is supposed to go into that. And in the end, I was finding that that even with three air changes per hour, there are a number of situations where if you're trying to keep your indoor air quality in good shape, that actually uh, automatically designing and putting in uh, recovery ventilation, uh, balanced ventilation of some kind, either heat or enthalpy. Um, is a good idea. And mm -hmm. one of the things we've been finding, which is a bit disturbing, is uh, crews are now getting really excited about getting a very airtight envelope, which is great. Let's make the houses very tight. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, sometimes the builder is not looking at the fact that they've gotten the house so tight that they've passed the threshold and they should be introducing balanced mechanical ventilation and they're not. We did a house a couple, uh, about a year ago where the builder was like, yoo-hoo, we hit a, a, a 1.3 ACH50. And I was like, do you have balanced ventilation on this? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, you're going to have mm -hmm. some indoor, it's going to be stuffy. You're going to have hot, you know, indoor air quality issues. Um, and, and so I, that, that brings me, that's going to segue me into... Uh, retrofits and new builds, right? Because although I was able to install the Zender CA350 and the plenums and the, the tubes and diffusers myself, um, there are, there, you, Zender did put together and has a unit that's specifically a small unit that just goes through the wall and plugs in and can just work. That's the CA70. Tell me a little about the, the 
three basic models that you guys offer as far as ventilation rates. And then I want to talk about the difference between the CA and the new Q series. Not sure what you mean by three separate models. Do you mean the CA-70, the regular yep. Comfortwares, and the Qs? Okay. Yeah. So the Comfortware 70 um, was developed for the retrofit market in Europe. Um, I will say typically exterior walls in European buildings because more often you'll see masonry, exterior insulation, and exterior stucco. The wall assembly is a lot thicker. And that cylinder that goes through the exterior wall is where the guts the heat exchanger is not there, but the fans um, that uh, bring in air and expel air are in that assembly. So you need an 11 inch wall cavity to do that. But beyond that, the heat exchanger is inside the thermal envelope and it is a sort of spot ventilation system that both supplies out of one side of the machine and returns out of the other. Uh, it's really designed to be at about 30 CFM. Uh, you can boost up to about 40 CFM. That's gonna affect ventilate a large interior space but not many interior spaces yeah like one got, or maybe one and a half right it, it could do two spaces and though it's been designed with knockouts on the side so that you can run a three inch duct from the unit to another space so you could exhaust a bathroom at 25 cfm and supply an adjacent room at 25 cfm and i've done that with some basement apartments and that's very effective um, and it's quiet uh, and it's not obtrusive, and you don't have to rip any drywall off to, to install it. Uh, you just have to make sure you keep your uh, thermal enclosure and your all the enclosures uh, sacrosanct. And, and yeah, air sealing, uh, water, uh, dampness, the whole bulk water exactly. and all that. When you're making a hole in the wall, whatever yes. it is, yeah. please make sure that you're you're dealing with you know, bulk water and vapor drive and, and all the different, uh, you know, building science forces that will exactly. be uh, acting. Exactly. There. Jim actually was one of the first Vermonters to have that unit installed in his house and is a big proponent. And his main point is, just like you said, he's got a you know, two by six wall. He's got 12 inches of this thing. He had to build a box outside to to uh, finish the, the run because of the way the sensors and, and other things yep. work. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that's the retrofit, and that's a great unit. And I think now uh, I'm going to throw a number out there, and you can shoot it down. But I think that retails for about seventeen hundred dollars. No, it retails lists for about twelve hundred dollars. Oh, twelve hundred. Oh, yeah. well, then the price yeah. came down for now. I remember that's great. Yeah, so that's great. Yep. So, and there is a contractor discount when we prepare a quote for uh, builders. We will take 10 percent off of that and um and then there's the chris west discount that's right which we, we can't discuss in this <laughs> we, we, interview nudge, nudge. so so deep that we can't uh, that's yeah. really what put in the special code idea yeah 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 <laughs> so once we okay so we've got the ca70 and the ca70 is a great unit for retrofits um it, it is in the market to be um uh competing with small units like the lunos um, and it does very well in that market. Um, the uh, the next step up is the CA or, or the 350 line because there's the Comfo Air and then there's the new Q series, right? Yep. I, I wouldn't necessarily broadly categorize our stuff in three different ways. There's the Q, which is a whole separate family of things with different controls, uh, higher efficiency, uh, web capability, um, uh modulating bypass, modulating preheater. It's, it's really like the state of the art of ventilation equipment right now. Um, it's, it's tough to sort of say our lesser model, because even our lesser model, the non-Q Comfortware Classic Series, still has amazing performance. And I'm, I'm of a mind where you don't necessarily need Wi-Fi capability in a ventilation system. Yeah. Just like, you know, set it up, get it running, and then forget about it. And if yeah. you have a boost switch in your bathroom, that's great. That said, uh, the app isn't just a spare controller for the Q series. It also does calculations based on measuring all four of the airstreams about how much, how many BTUs per hour per year you will save over time by using heat recovery. So avoided heat heating or an avoided cooling is a pretty interesting thing to know because a lot of people say, why am I going to spend so much on a Zender when it's more than another manufacturer? Well, you can calculate the the if you want to do those calculations the heat loss calcs to to figure that out and if you live in an 
expensive energy area that's that's a shorter shorter return so get back to your question the ca70 through the wall uh, decentralized it's its own thing the rest of the comfort air units the 160 the 200 the 350 and the 550 all operate with the same kind of controller all can come in hrv and erv versions and are um, more based on the dutch models that stork air had made prior to zender uh absorbing Stork Air into its portfolio of companies. Um, and so they're awesome machines. They run quietly. And like you, I did a project and got a Comfort Air 350 for my home before I was a Zender employee. And that's what turned me on to how amazing these machines are. So when I did a house for myself in Rockport, Massachusetts, um, and it was going to be double stud walls, basically pretty good house, uh, triple glazed windows, the R10, what's Joe's? description of this r5 windows r10 under the slab r20 below grade r40 above grade and r60 in the roof yeah i just basically abided by that as a result i hit 0.4 ach by just riding the builder saying make sure you tape everything properly and ACH let me take 50. a look at things sorry at ach 15 yeah i don't do i don't often do per square foot of shell so yeah so so thank you sure. um and hit a very very good number now uh so the all of our units can can provide great ventilation, but you have to decide how much of the house is being covered. And if it's a big house with a lot of bathrooms, you have to pick a larger unit. And as you said earlier, not so much oversize it, but pick a unit that can do the ventilation rate, whether it's the Passive House Institute rate or the ASHRAE rate or the International Mechanical rate at a medium speed. Right. And now, the sweet spot the of the motors and, and the, exactly. the whole exactly. thing, right? The motors, the yeah. the heat exchanger, yep. et cetera. That's right. That's right. And and one of the interesting things about the machines is all of them come with four speeds. And those speeds are allocated. The highest speed is the boost mode. You can temporarily increase the speed of the machine when there's a high pollution event. Is this a family show? No. When there's a high pollution event, uh, and then the speed beneath that is the one I used for designing to meet the, the uh, local regulations, if there are any in your jurisdiction. Then there's two speeds below that. The lowest one is called away. There doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense if you're away for three or four days and there's no CO2 being generated and no cooking and no showers to run the system at the same speed. You're presuming occupancy generates moisture, generates CO2. And so a lower speed, and it's not off, it's about 15% of capacity, will keep VOCs that may be on construction products, formaldehydes and furniture, um, leftover pet dander that may be blowing around. So we always believe in ventilation, and the away mode will still provide ventilation even if nobody's there. Then that remaining speed in between the code one and the away one, I often find and suggest to customers that once you get in your house, once the moisture is all evaporated from your plaster and your concrete is cured, see if you can run the system at a lower speed and still have good indoor air quality. The boost speed still is the highest speed, but if you go back to a lower speed, you've, your listeners already know that you'll increase the effectiveness, the tr heat transfer recovery, because the air is in the heat exchanger longer at a lower speed. So if you're still getting good IAQ, you make out, you save pennies uh, on your electric bill and you're still doing the job of ventilation so and it's quieter and preserves machine life so so it's it's great to have those four controls yeah so um so the the 160 the 200 the 350 mm -hmm. and the 550 those are the the steps yep. right yep. um and at some point i mean i have i haven't done this yet but at some point i'm gonna do a, a walk through on on how um passive house uh, looks at ventilation. Uh, the Pascal's mm. Institute U.S. Um, there are basically three metrics we use: uh, a third of the ventilation volume per hour, so you know the ventilation volume, uh, the volume that's inside of the house, right? That's actually going to be moved by the by the, the air handler. Um, uh, um, and uh, once you know the ventilation volume, if you know what a third of that is, that means that every three hours the entire indoor air has been refreshed. And that's, that's one target, uh, one possible target. Another target is the ash ray of 18 CFM per person. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last one is the, the FIAS extraction uh, ventilation, which is where we, we exhaust from moist areas at a certain rate. Kitchens are 36, 
bathrooms are 24, the laundry rooms and mud rooms are 12 CFM. So you just line those all up. And when you line those up, you balance those with supplies to the other rooms, your bedrooms, your living rooms, offices, etc. Until and with a, a family of four, um, it ends up somewhere around 100 CFM, right? Um, and you can you can uh, look at the the ASHRAE numbers, and that's almost always lower. Um, and sometimes the third is higher. Um, so, um, finding that sweet spot for, for your space, but having those speeds, having that, you know, 100%, 77%, 57% and, uh, the 15%, those four speed options, if I have those right, uh, for the Zender, um, those are the, the options to, to, to ramp it down. Like you were saying, if you're in your house and your, your indoor air quality is great, no reason to run it at speed three. You can run it or at speed, I mean, speed two, which is that 77. Bring it down to speed one, which is a 54 and see what your indoor air quality is. I want to jump in and clarify something. Yep. That um, Those percentages that you mentioned are not based on the capacity of the machine. They're based on the calculated rate of, of what your, of, of the ventilation standard. So the continuous rate that you come up with based on ASHRAE or FIAS or PHI or International Mechanical Road, that is a speed that you must comply with. In Passive House Institute, Germany, they limit the amount of boost such that that is 100% of what you are allowed to use for air movement through the space. And it has nothing to do with the machine. Right. Somebody gives you an oversized unit, you're not using 100% of that unit. So you, those numbers, the 177, and it's actually 54, I believe, not 77, are the proportions of three settings based on a calculated airflow. The middle one is usually the continuous flow rate, the higher one's the boost, and then there's a low speed for when you're away. Right. Um, and sometimes people get uh, caught up in 100% of, of fan speed. No, it's 100% of the flow calculation rate in boost mode. Uh, there often is much more capacity in an ERV than the equivalent of 100 over 77 of what the continuous flow rate is and i hope i'm not losing people there with that no i mean we get certainly more. deep in the in the uh the the material but uh yep. Yep. What, on our show we like expanding people's understanding yep. and one yep. of the ways you do that is expose them to new information um yep. and and when i go back i may throw some graphics on to help on help people understand uh, that that that's that's a good idea because graphically, you know, people aren't necessarily always verbal learners. I know I'm not, so um, I'm trying not to talk with my hands so much. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're both talking with our hands. <laughs> exactly. I know we're so, all yeah, once, once you calculate that rate, and and those three that you mentioned, 18 CFM per person and 12, 24, 36, and 0.3 air changes per hour, the highest of those is the, the one you're supposed to choose. And if it happens to be the 12, 24, 36, that's actually the boost mode. And so if exactly. your kitchen's at 36 CFM and that is the 100% of what you're supposed to use, then the continuous mode is 77% of right. that, and the next lowest speed is 77% of that, which winds up being 54% of 100. <laughs> and what's really important is one of the things you get back when you do a FIAS project and you send in your your ideas on what, what flow rates are is that even at that 77%, that, that, that you know, the rate at which you'll be having that machine on most of the time, you still have yep. minimum rates. You still have to hit 28 CFM for a kitchen. You still have to hit 18 CFM for a bathroom. So there, even at that reduced rate, we do have you know minimums in order to make sure. Uh, yep. and, and by we, I'm saying FIAS. I mean, I'm just a, a, a passive consultant. So uh, yep. the FIAS yep. community, let's just say sure. that way. Sure, and, and one also must be careful that local codes, if they have a higher rates than what FIAS superseded. or yep. PHI allows, it has to be superseded, which I'm not sure that a powder room that would have gotten 12 CFM in Germany, which is 20 cubic meters per hour, if, if going up to, from 12 that PHI would allow to 20 to meet an ASHRAE standard. I don't think that's going to blow your annual uh, energy heating demands, yeah. but, but it, it, it might, and it's worth looking at. And, yeah. um, but that's when, uh, when we're, t I mean, I'm a huge CA fan. I've been using the Kumpfo airs for a very long time and I am with you on, I don't necessarily think that all of the bells and whistles of the, the new Q series are necessary for me personally, but it's not just that because we, we also have a, a seriously improved ERV SRE efficiency, right? 
I mean, the, the CA yeah. is uh, something like 74, 76% efficient on the, on the core, on the sensible recovery efficiency. But I for saw the numbers for the QR, for the yeah, for the ERV. I know the HR, well, I can't do ERVs in Vermont. So um, they just seriously dry out the house um, in the winter time. Should be the other way around, Chris. I mean, I, I don't know what your experience has been. And it, and it varies based on how much moisture is dumped into the house. It isn't just a climate-based or geography-based thing. But I have seen people who insisted on HRVs and are cranking their air conditioning in the summertime. And the space that is being cooled, the surface temperatures are at or below dew point, wow. meaning meaning the supply registers in the room are chilled by the air conditioning that are around there. And I'm talking the ventilation supply registers. Right. If those are at... 68 degrees and the dew point temperature of the incoming air is 70 or 69 or 75 you are going to get condensation on those devices yeah. maybe it doesn't happen enough but i've seen it in coastal and humid conditions that that's important so i would char challenge you to start considering ervs because since they do recover moisture and moisture is precious interior moisture is precious in the winter time especially in vermont cold climate why would you want to expel all the moisture that you've generated. Now, it's not saying that you're gonna preserve odors and, uh, and cooking fumes and moisture from the shower, but some of that is gonna be redirected back into the space, not with contaminants in it, but just the pure water right, vapor Right, after going molecules. through the core, yeah. No, yep. I, yep. I only do ERVs in my climate. I had an HRV the first year uh, that we put the unit in and ah. Um, we were so dried out in the winter. It yeah. was unbelievable. Yeah. We were, I, I think I misheard you then. Yeah. I, I may have misheard you or something. Sorry about that. No, yeah. I'm an ERV in our climate guy. Definitely. I don't, I, I, I'm, uh, not only just because that's the, the general, uh, advice from the building science point of view, but I lived it. And in mm. that first winter, the hu relative humidity was hovering around 20% and we were all, you know, with nosebleeds and scale, you know, yeah. itchy skin. It was really unpleasant. And I swapped it out and nobody even thinks about it anymore. Yes. Yes. It's I'm not at 40% relative humidity in the winter here in Vermont. I'm at like 30, but boy, that 10% makes all the difference absolutely, in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not the heat. It's the humidity. Yeah, exactly. It's not <laughs> the heat. It's the humidity. So, um, yeah. But the, I, I was recently doing some modeling for a project and, and they were specking the Q, uh, the new Q line. I think it was the Q600, um, yep, yep. which is not, which is comparable in airflow to the CA350, right? Do I have that right? Nope. The 600 is uh, almost twice as much. Oh, um, so it, is, it is still related yep, yep, to that. Same okay. modeling uh, ideas. And I didn't mean to... Um, uh, speak ill of our Q series at all. They're amazing machines. And when I tell people that the Comfo Air Q350 has a sensible recovery effectiveness of 86% for the ERV, which is amazing. They almost don't believe me. Yeah. They, they almost don't believe me. Yeah. And so if you can recover 86% of the temperature difference, and by the way, that number is not the same at all fan speeds. It's kind of an average of a range among a range of fan speeds. So as you said earlier, lower the fan speed. If you still have good IAQ, you're probably ratcheting up the uh, effectiveness, which right. is great. Right. So yeah, the Q's the Q's absolutely amazing. And um, and aside from that, especially in a cold climate like yours, in winter time, some manufacturers make machines that use. Uh, an imbalanced strategy to protect the core from any freezing that might occur. Yeah. So they ramp down the intake and keep the exhaust the same so that exhaust is room temperature. The intake air is outdoor polar cold temperatures. You won't get as much frost. We don't believe in that. We believe in not depressurizing the building and always bringing fresh air, filtered air in. So you have to apply a little bit of electricity to that. Older models or, or non-CAQ models will pulse on a all or nothing electric resistance preheater that comes in the fresh air stream. It's not a space heater. It's pr to protect the core. The Q is smart enough in its logic and controls to know how much of its total capacity it should put into the incoming air because it's also looking at the outgoing air and calculates the point at which frost in the recovery core could occur. And so there's a lot more sophisticated controls. And in that sense, I, I still rec I recommend them highly. They're great. And eventually, probably, we'll only have queues down the road, but we still have a lot of demand for the uh, slightly lesser priced regular Comfortware Classic, we're calling it. Right. Now, and that, that was my point. Uh, I mean, like I said, I love the bells and whistles. I love the, the data yeah. collection. I love the yeah. increased efficiencies on the core, especially on the ERV side. Uh, yeah. I, I've just been taken to 
during design phases to accept uh, uh, an SRE of about 0.76 for the for the yeah. Comfo Air ERV core yeah. and seeing an 80, you know, an 86 or an 85 percent, you know, sensible recovery efficiency on the core for this new unit. That's a game changer as far as efficiency. That's that's, you know, 10 points. And if you slow that down, you're saying, you know, you know, there is a curve. If you're into engineering, there's a curve that they have which shows at what speed that that's core right. is going to give you efficiency wise. And, and that that's is right. um, something that for the type of modeling that we're doing, the static modeling, which is usually, you know, uh, uh, good enough to get us really good information on how a building will, will act, we don't need to approximate that curve all that well. The, you know, just one SRE number is enough. But we're not doing that with um, with eight, with uh, 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 heat pumps, right? With heat pumps, we're putting in the 47 degree COP, we're putting in the 17 degree COP, and then the, the program is saying, okay, that means that the efficiency curve is this. And based on the outside temperature, it's going to be able to be this efficient, use this much electricity. Uh, so uh, similarly, maybe in the future, uh, we'll see uh, slightly better you know, numbers for tracking exactly what that is. And you're saying that the, the, uh, the queue actually can tell you what the makeup air is that you're saving between outside air or just bringing outside yep. air and yep yep and so it does that core. calculation based on uh i believe it's just a the the heating saved it doesn't i don't i think there's too many variables to calculate the the pounds of grains of moisture and things right, like that right, to do that right. calculation um, it's not going to deal with latent loads it's going to be straight up just uh, sensible yeah, loads that's yeah, right yeah. so but what i like to tell customers who are sort of into this but but could easily get lost is that in Vermont, if it's 10 degrees outside in the winter, a nice balmy January day of 10 degrees, and and you keep it at 70 degrees indoors, just to make the math easy, you've got a delta T of 60 degrees. Right. If your efficiency is 80%, you're going to make up eight tenths of that difference. So that's what your supply temperature would be, except the preheater is going to influence that supply temperature by warming up the air coming in until it gets to about 24 degrees on the before it enters the core. So then you start doing the calculation of efficiency between that smaller delta T, your supply temperature is warmer. That's what remains to be heated by your heat pump or whatever your heat source is or your solar gain. Um, and that's those numbers are extraordinary when you have 86% recovery effectiveness. Yeah, it's, it's more, really more amazing. amazing than yeah. the 74, 76%, that, that extra 10%. Far more. Because you're running that thing 24-7. And, and that, that's another bit. That brings me... Uh, interestingly enough, to the idea and the question about um, yeah, ground source uh, preheaters, mm -hmm. the the Comfo funds, yep. which is no, another unit that I would have loved to have used at my house, but uh, my yep. house is on ledge, so there's not enough depth to put uh, pecs in the ground. So tell us a little bit about, about the Comfo funds. Sure. So in cold climates, the benefit of living in perhaps Burlington is that you have cultural access and it's a lovely place with views across the lake but it's cold and so you pay an energy penalty to live in a cold climate no matter where it is one of the ways to make sure your ventilation system doesn't freeze up when moisture is leaving the building and cold air is coming in is the resistance preheater i talked about earlier another way to do that although it requires substantially more initial investment cost is to lay a, a loop of conductive material, a tubing of some kind, well piping, uh, polyethylene well piping is just fine, that black stuff you use for, for um, well piping. And based on the conductivity of the soil, whether it's more clay than sand, um, based on the diameter of the tube, based on the airflow for the design of the project, we can come up with a proposal for a ground source heat exchanger that runs a loop of 50% uh, glycol through a heat exchanger prior to getting to the through, to the ERV, and so it is powered. Uh, well, it gets the power from the machine from, from the ERV, but it only uses a 20 watt pump to circulate that mixture throughout yeah, the entire circuit loop. Pumps use very little energy. Exactly, and so and so as a result, the benefit you get of pre-warming 
winter air by using the temperature of the ground, which maybe is 45 degrees or 43 degrees in your neck of the woods, but the air is 10 degrees. So there is a benefit to doing some heat recovery and running that 20 watt pump. Now the air coming out of that ground loop heat exchanger has been brought up to temperature, a higher temperature without using a lot of resistance electricity to do that. Then it enters the heat recovery device or the energy recovery device. And now your supply temperatures are coming in very close to room temperature. So in a bigger project that has the ability to either drill a well, if you're drilling a well any for the way for the house, you can run a loop down there. Or if you're doing a septic field, you can run it around the field. They do have to be apart from each other so that they can recharge and not rob Peter to pay Paul. Right. Uh, you need, so you need, need to that. not decrease the temperature of the ground. Um, That's right. So, so I, what I remember, and, and I just remind me, uh, uh, basically it was 300 feet of of uh, one and a quarter inch pecs was what I was told back in the day, and they should be 12 inches apart. That was what the advice was. That would have been project specific, so I wouldn't say that that's the number to always use. And um, the last one I designed, it had to be 30 centimeters apart, this 12 inches minimum, but be higher is better. Yeah, the, the, the more, more distance, distance between them is better. Right. Yeah. As with anything, if you're pulling heat out of a system that is not, you got to be able to give it the time to regenerate that heat. Um, That's speaking right. of that, um, I've heard some people talk about, you know, uh, continuing to use the compo funds in the summer to reduce uh, moisture by, by dehumidifying the air. What's, what's the skinny on that? The skinny is that I try to tell people that it's not active dehumidification. There's no refrigerator coil. There's no, we're not compressing any refrigerant or anything like that. It's simply uh, a liquid that doesn't freeze. But will transfer heat from the soil to the liquid. So if it's hot and humid and the glycol is at 55 degrees, then it's bound to extract some of the moisture across its heat exchanger that will drip out and drain away and thus cool and dry the air. But I want to be careful to make sure that people understand that it's not like a heat pump. <laughs> it's, it's not just, It's not like a dehumidifier yeah. you have in your basement, but it does... It's kind of like the, the heat pump out water heater. It's not a dehumidifier, but it has some dehumidification effect. That's right. Okay. That's right. So so if somebody came to me in Tallahassee, Florida, or Louisiana and said, oh, I want to use a comfort fund to pre-chill and pre-dehumidify my house, I'd say, well, that's great. You're welcome to use that, but you better have a whole house de dehumidification system because an ERV and a comfort fund are not going to meet all your humidity goals where 11 months of the year it's unbearable right uh, but in my climate here, here in vermont part of what that will allow is if i've taken a lot of heat out of the ground during the winter cycle i'll be able to put some heat back in the ground during the summer cycle because you know we'll be bringing in the cold air we'll be adding heat to it because the air is warmer um so that yeah uh, we do the same thing when we design uh, ground source heat pump systems that are closed loop, right? You want to be able yep. to make sure that, that you're not just taking heat out, but you're also adding heat depending on the season. So that's why you shouldn't put your ground loop under your basement slab. It should be outdoors. <laughs> um, and more specifically, I believe it needs to recharge because of solar gain. Um, I don't think it's always recharging because of the, you can't rely on the annual temperature always being so warm as to recharge in your climate, you're going to be taking out a lot more heat than you put back in, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And so, um, yes, it's good. You will get a cooling benefit. I don't think it's going to be as good as your heating benefit. Yeah, I think the, that's, that's the delta T's are, are just not the right, the same. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's like you said, it's so dependent on uh, the the ground geology on on groundwater moving through, if the t pipes are un in the groundwater or not, yeah. there, there's a lot there. And, and those things can change every five feet, uh, you know, in a, on a location. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, so getting towards the end of the interview, um, I think that I, I, I love the Q line. I'm really excited about, you know, seeing one in action. Uh, I think my CA350 is probably going to be doing service for another 20, 30 years <laughs> before. Yeah. And now I won't be around to see when it needs to be replaced. And maybe by that time, we'll be on from Q into another letter of the alphabet on the efficiencies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, 
once again, I'm uh, I've always been a big fan of Zender. Uh, it's it's the basic unit that I recommend for people. And on that, you brought that up for just a moment. Uh, the uh, other manufacturers that first of all don't have the cross counter flow uh, core, right? They only have mm -hmm. a, a cross flow core, the little square ones, and they add two mm -hmm. in a row. That um, that the manufacturers do use a uh, a core defrost, which is recycling the inside air, um, which reduces the um, the flows. So if you're designing uh, with one of these other units that that does have uh, a process where it defrosts the core by recirculating in, indoor air, that can be as much as a half hour in an hour if the core is badly frozen. So at mm -hmm. that time, you're getting 50% of the air outdoor air that you're expecting to get. And that's one of the reasons that I've, I've always been uh, less interested in using those models. Although they have a place, uh, they're significantly cheaper uh, to make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but when we're dealing with indoor air quality, personally, I, I want to go with, uh, with a unit that I have a lot of, a lot of uh, experience with and a lot of uh, confidence in. Um, and in the end, uh, Peter Schneider did a study years ago, uh, the the energy it took to run his the Comfu funds on one house and, and the resistance electric on the CA350 specifically. It doesn't have that wonderful Q model modulation thing going on. It's just pretty mm -hmm. stupid machine in that way. But what he found was that the Comfu funds used with the pump energy and the fan coil energy, it used about the same, slightly less energy than the resistance heater, um, but did really? have the added benefit of increasing the incoming air to a, a higher temperature so your delta t's are lower there's a lot in there of course but yeah he must have compared that to the avoided heating to figure out what the net of that was um that's interesting I, i'm guessing that the the 1.2 kilowatts of power that can be pumped into the uh airstream with the electric resistance preheater might just generate more saved energy and thus a higher supply temperature than the comfort fund but i'd like to see those numbers i have my them, my so. experience is from what his he was showing it was the the opposite the comfort wow. fund was was using wow. less energy but that in the end it was something like a hundred dollars a year to run the comfort funds and 140 dollars a year to run the resistance electric the, the 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 amount difference was not significant enough for him to say wow every house should have a comfort funds and that was really yeah and it's disruptive you can, certainly can't do it in dense neighborhoods because yeah. you need a lot of surface area to do that and if you have town water you can't do that yeah, you know exactly. if if electricity if you're generating if you're if you have solar and it, you can fit it into your load and can calculate your uh heating degree days below 23 degrees, which are probably substantial in Vermont, then you could actually start to make a case for, well, maybe the resistance heater, even though it uses a lot more power at any given one time, I, you can afford it because you're, you're, the sun is powering it. So yeah. Um, yeah. that's where I'd like to head, actually. Great. So yeah. 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 Well, I'm actually getting solar panels installed next month. So going at zero, took a number of years to get it going, but we'll be there. Great. So, Congrats. John, um, yeah. if someone is interested in knowing more about Zender units and Zender products, mm. what's the best way to get in touch with Zender? Are you the person they should reach out to? How would you like for people to interact with Zender? Yeah, yeah. So if this was 2014 when we first met at Better Buildings by Design or wherever we met back then, I would say, yeah, sure. But we've grown substantially, and so we get a lot more quotes across North America, and I might be assisted by some of my colleagues in our office in New Hampshire to do the quotes. But somebody who wants to initially reach out, certainly you can do that through our website, zenderamerica.com. Make sure you spell Zender correctly, Z-E-H-N-D-E-R. Um, my email is john.rockwell at zenderamerica. You'll find our phone numbers there, and I will do a design for you. If you provide PDFs of a project for me, I will do a design for your your needs that meets the whatever criteria you want. If you don't say anything about the codes, I just make sure that it meets the local codes. If it's a specific passive house project, I'd like to get the flow rates based on the treated floor area and ventilation volume, as you've described earlier. So that's what you provide to us, Chris. Um, but yeah, that's the way to reach out to us. And uh, I do lunch and learns at architecture offices now that 
hopefully COVID is going to subside and the Delta variant won't take over, but uh, love to get out and do outreach to engineering firms and architecture offices. More engineering firms is great, especially for multifamily, because they're the ones that are decision makers about specking the, the products. But, um, and there's lots of resources on our website with uh, little videos and things about how to do things. So that's how you reach out. Perfect. Well, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to spend 45 minutes chatting with me about, uh, you know, heat recovery ventilation and enthalpy recovery and ventilation and the, the Zender line. And um, I, I assume that you're going to be at the Passfaust Conference in Tarrytown in October. Currently scheduled to be there. Got the hotel room booked. We've got a booth set up. We'll see how they fare with uh, the Delta variant. But yeah. I, I appreciate, Chris, you asking me to do this. And uh, it's nice to connect with you again. And uh, we've had good conversations about building science. And I hope we can have more of them in person. Well, the House Calls for Mono is going to have a booth. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing uh, live uh, interviews there. So I'll, I'll probably do a walk around at some point and we'll We'll chat some more. Uh, and we didn't even yeah. get to talk about both of our love of of uh, of singing. So at some point, we'll, oh, yeah. we'll talk yeah. about that. I've got a gig tonight oh, in cool. two hours, three hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. you know, have some, some tea with lemon or, or whatever it is that you do for getting your voice ready. And, <laughs> we'll, uh, and we'll be in touch at some point in the future. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks. Okay.